Well, Pastor Scott, somebody wrote in and wanted to know about the acrostic heroes, like a, maybe a more detailed explanation on how helpful it is to utilize those letters to rem remind yourself of the most critical arguments or evidences for the Christian faith. Yeah, you know, uh, the, the acrostic heroes is something that I came up with kind of out of uh, necessity more than anything else, because uh, one of the most important questions, one of the most important things that we can do, I think, in engaging with non-believers is to bring everything back to one central issue. Did Jesus rise from the dead? Because if he rose from the dead in a moment of history that can be verified to the satisfaction of any fair inquirer, well then everything he had to say about life, death, the afterlife, the meaning of life, what it means to know God, is there a God, all the things that Jesus said are validated by that one historical event. And the Bible really throws down the gauntlet on that. Uh, you know, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, we are told in no uncertain terms in Scripture that uh, if Jesus isn't raised, uh, you're still in your sins. Uh, in fact, if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, we are of, among all men most to be pitied. Uh, so uh, Christianity really does stand or fall on that historical event. And, and so when I share with people, whatever question comes up, whatever controversy comes up, one of the things that I use is this strategy of saying, let's bring the conversation back to the person of Jesus Christ. I'm on kind of a one-note piano when it comes to the, that sort of thing for a couple reasons. First of all, no more important issue than that. You know, secondly, when I do that, and, and I would just encourage those of you out here kind of nervous about sharing your faith, if you make Jesus the subject of the conversation, chances are you're going to know a little bit more about Jesus than the person you're talking to. You have the advantage of playing on your home court. But inevitably, when you bring it back to the person of Jesus and what he said, and Jesus made some uh, pretty radically different takes on issues than, uh, say, uh, passes for uh, wokeness in our day and age, well, why should I listen to Jesus? Well, he rose from the dead. Well, how can you possibly know that? So that's really where it comes down to. That's the nub of the issue. And so when it comes down to that, how can you possibly know that Jesus rose from that? Why should any rational person believe that, right? It is super critical to first ask a question. First of all, if I can show you um, six reasons why a rational person should believe Jesus rose from the dead, would you consider what he has to say? And if they go, well, yeah, sure. Uh, then share away. If they fold their arms and say, no, my mind's made up and I've decided and this is it, um, well, then just say, you know, man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. If you want to know more about Jesus and why he rose from the dead, I'll be happy to share it with you. Hmm. But if you do, and oftentimes, more often than we think we do, one of the people go, well, yeah, why? would someone believe he rose from the dead? I put together this acrostic just to keep me on track in the presentation and hopefully give not just that person I'm sharing with who's on the outside in looking at a relationship with Jesus, something to really chew on, but also I've shared this a number of times with our flock because if you've got this down, right, you've got covered the most important issue you're ever going to get into mm -hmm. in sharing with a non-believer. And if you're confident about it, it's going to increase the possibility, as uh, Greg Kukul would say, of getting in the batter's box uh, for the first time. Very few Christians actually share their faith with non-believers, even evangelical mm -hmm. Christians. Study after study has shown <clears throat> this. And I think it's because of that fear that people have. Well, what if they ask me a hard question? What if they, well, you got this down. You've got a place to go. You've got a hill to die on, if you will. So that acrostic, he rose, the first letter in the acrostic stands for history. In other words, uh, the Bible doesn't begin when it speaks of Jesus with the words a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. It purports to tell us the facts of what God has done for us in history. You know, I love what Dr. Luke said about this at the beginning of the biography of Jesus that bears his name. Uh, if you think someone says that the Bible is fantasy and fairy tales, well, listen to what the Bible says about itself. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as many who were at the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write you an orderly account 
most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. At the beginning of the book of Acts, uh, Luke goes on in his introductory remarks there. It was like uh, 2.0 as far as his biography of Jesus to this Theophilus fellow. And he said, uh, I, Jesus showed himself alive through many infallible proofs. Okay, so in, in other words, Luke is saying that you can verify this. You can take a look at this. You can check it out according to history. How do we check out any good historical uh, claim or document? John. The same way that you test anything else in history. You need eyewitnesses, which is what the word history means, and you need reason to trust them as reliable sources. Generally, historians, people who study eyewitness testimony, look for around four to six things. If they're close or even contemporary, they're living at the time of the events that they're reporting, they call those primary sources. They were an associate or at least had access to the people who were direct eyewitnesses. That's the best second bet. If you have information that is accurate, meaning non-anachronistic, that they're reporting things that are accurate given the time, place, and events that they're reporting. They don't uh, say, for example, report of uh, uh, you know, F-22 uh, fighters uh, making blanket runs over D-Day and so forth. That yeah. would be a, a questionable be a problem. historical yeah. report. Yeah. So non-anachronistic, accurate in their reports. And then, of course, the most important is accounts of embarrassment, that they admit to details that would either culturally at their time or just in broad strokes hurt their case. They have to admit to things. Another comparable example to this are hostile reports that people obviously that aren't in agreement with the cause that they're reporting or in favor of the event that they're reporting, but admit to basic facts that are also reported by the people who are in support of them, like, for instance, the Bible. We don't expect, for instance, Pilate, Tiberius, <coughs> uh, Quirinius, and others to report that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead, but we do at least need them to mention the name of this individual or have in existence the kind of circumstances that the gospel accounts report. This may seem loose and goose to you, but that is actually sufficient for historical analysis. And when it comes to examining the historicity of the Gospels, we have one of the founding members of Harvard and the leading world scholar on evidence, his Sir, attorney, yeah. Sir Simon Greenleaf, yeah. reporting that in his examination of the Gospel of Luke on its own, you would have something completely admissible in an unbiased courtroom. Yeah, and there was no unbiased jury that would come to any other conclusion that Jesus rose from the dead. Whether yeah. you find an unbiased jury is another question, yeah. but noting it sufficiently meets the criteria of history. So when we talk about history, uh, we talk about the Bible mentioning places, it mentioning names, mentioning customs, mentioning ways of doing commerce that uh, can be verified by archaeological analysis. In other words, the Bible tells us in no uncertain terms that uh, it is writing history. And dovetailing with that, and you mentioned that, the E stands for eyewitness testimony. In other words, the, the Bible wasn't written hundreds of years after the events. Uh, Peter and John, when they were brought before the same seasoned group of political power brokers that orchestrated the crucifixion of Jesus, uh, laid down the gauntlet when they said, whether it is right in the eyes of God to listen to you rather than God, you be the judge. But we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. In other words, the disciples were willing to offer testimony not based on hearsay, not based upon someone told me who told somebody else. They said they saw Jesus risen from the dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about the eyewitnesses that verified the gospel, literally the good news, news in the same sense that we would Use the, well, I hesitate to use it because there's so much fake news out there, but say there was a legitimate news operation out there. Uh, news in that same sense, a reporting of what happened in the day. That's what the term gospel literally means. And in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, a, a litany of eyewitnesses who uh, saw Jesus rose from the dead is presented, including over 500 at this, who saw him at the same time. So we believe that Jesus rose from the dead on the basis of eyewitness testimony. Now, in a court of law, uh, there's two ways that you can establish a fact, circumstantial evidence and eyewitness testimony. Circumstantial evidence is kind of like the Columbo thing where he, yeah, I got a problem here and he puts together you know, three or four things and comes to a conclusion. But usually there's nobody who saw the bad guy do it. 
apart from the bad guy. Yeah. So if you've got an eyewitness who is credible, who stands up under examination, that triumphs circumstantial evidence every time. Now, we could ask ourselves the question, and we'll get to this just in just a second, are the disciples credible? But hold on to that. Eyewitness testimony. People saw Jesus risen from the dead. The R stands for the riddle of the empty tomb. Uh, you know, it's uh, one thing that is accepted by scholars of all stripes, uh, secular and sainted, is that three days after Jesus died, his tomb was empty. Well, there's all kinds of ways to try to explain that. Uh, one of them is that uh, Jesus didn't really die on the cross. It's called the swoon theory, that it just seemed like he died, put into the tomb, uh, the cool air, they usually say, in the tomb, or maybe the spices in which he was anointed, revived him. He removed the stone and escaped, and his disciples saw him and mistook that for a resurrection. I've sat, honest to goodness, in secular university classes where professors with lots of letters after their names have seriously put that forward as an explanation. Despite what's, secular. What's, <laughs> what's the problem with that? Well, first of all, did Jesus die on the cross? Well, we know historically that every crucifixion victim had to have their death certified by no less than four witnesses that the Romans would put forth. They had to certify the person was dead before he would be taken down. How was Jesus' death certified? We are told in the Gospel of John that one of the Roman soldiers took a Roman pike, a long spear, shoved it into Jesus' side, and blood and water flowed from the wound. Only then was Jesus allowed to come down from the cross. It's very clear, and we can go into the details about the blood and water and what's involved with all of that, but it's very clear that these individuals would have no desire whatsoever to take somebody down from the cross unless they knew he was actually dead. They had to do it because Passover was coming. They did it kind of as a sop to the, the Jews uh, because they didn't want to have dead bodies hanging around on their high holy day. So uh, Jesus' death was certain. Uh, but say, for sake of argument, he just swooned. He was placed inside a tomb. Well, the tomb that Jesus was placed in uh, had a rock that was rolled into place in front of it that weighed anywhere from 800 pounds to two tons. You're telling me that an individual who had gone through the mauling that Jesus had experienced at the hands of the Romans, scourging, which oftentimes is enough to kill people, they call it the living death, that he was crucified for six hours, that a Roman soldier shoved a pike into his side and blood and water flowed from the wound. You're going to tell me that this guy revived and was able to well, bench press or maybe squat thrust an 800-pound to 1,002-ton uh, stone out of the way. To add to this, that uh, tomb was secured by a detachment of Roman soldiers, sealed with Caesar's seal. For a Roman soldier to allow Caesar's seal to be broken in an unauthorized way would result in them being crucified. So they were very, very motivated. So you're telling me that this guy who's gone through all of this somehow revives in the tomb, bench presses the 800-pound to two-ton stone, overcomes an incredibly motivated and armed-to-the-teeth battalion of Roman soldiers, and then somehow escapes, looking more like hamburger helper than anything else, and says, I risen from the dead. And everybody, Oh, yeah, it's a miracle that's going on here. You believe that, you have more faith than I do. Now, there's others like the mistaken identity thing. Okay, you can mistake someone's identity, but you're not going to be able to mistake the identity of someone who has the wounds of crucifixion still upon them. It wasn't mistaken identity, and so on. Uh, the riddle of the empty tomb. There's only one theory that fits the facts, that he actually rose from the dead just as he said he was going to. The supernatural theory is the only one that explains all of the data that we have from the eyewitness accounts. The O in our acrostic stands for the overwhelming change in the life of the disciples. You know, let's face it, the disciples hardly distinguished themselves on the night that Jesus was betrayed. They basically turned tail and ran and tried to say, Peter swore up and down he would never deny Jesus, denied him three times. So suddenly you have this group of individuals that basically were living for their, their own survival. That was their number one priority, who are willing at this point not just to testify to things they'd seen and heard, but were so committed to what they had seen and heard, they were willing to die for it. We are told of the 11 disciples that were left after Judas Iscariot uh, betrayed Jesus. 10 out of the 11 died brutal, grisly, torturous deaths 
rather than renounce their claim that Jesus rose from the dead. That was the point they were willing to die for. The other one uh, was the Apostle John, and uh, he was at one point tossed in a uh, pot of boiling oil uh, to get him to repent, and uh, he still would not change his tune. And not during a time in his life where he had the uh, spry vigor of youth to help him shrug off such a traumatic experience. Yeah, so, I mean, someone's pointing to me, at me at the French fry vat and says, uh, change your story. Uh, either I'm absolutely convinced something is true, the pain of death, or I'm going to say, ha, oh, we just made it up. Oh, we just thought it was a great way to make a religion. We can make big money off of this, and uh, we're really sorry we'll go away now. And recognize what's being argued here. We're not saying that people don't lie. Of course they do. We're not saying that it's impossible for Roman soldiers to fall asleep at the tomb. Of course they do. What we're asking for is all the data to be considered and explanatory power to be given credit. If the overwhelming change in the lives of the disciples is worth the paper it's printed on, it's only going to be worth something if it came from, see the point we made about history, primary sources. Anyone can die for a lie, but they have to believe that it's true. These men were the ones coming up with the story, and they all unanimously laid down their lives, or at least endured lives of brutal torture, exile, and persecution as a result of their decisions. Every single one of them either went to their deaths or endured more than most of us would even willing to be standing for if it was really that worth that much. There are people who will give up the truth under pressure. But these men were so convinced that they saw Jesus die and they saw him alive again after that publicly verifiable and historically certain death, according to atheist scholars, as much as Christians, as we said. You're talking about someone who is not only forming the story, but is proving sincerity. Now note, if you have a bunch of sincere people, well, what if it was a hallucination? You end up creating a bigger miracle than the crucifixion and resurrection itself. If you have a hallucination, you have a dreamlike state that you're seeing while you're awake. People who have hallucinations don't all share hallucinations. Yeah, 500 people at once don't have the same hallucination. Just like 500 people at one time aren't going to have the exact same dream in a sleep-like state. There are reports of, quote, mass hallucinations, but if you actually look at the reports, it turns out that there's common threads of their environment. Like, for instance, the one they'll often point to is this vision that a crowd had of the Virgin Mary descending upon Fatima, the Fatima, yeah. 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 But the problem was... When you say, oh, they all reported the same thing, it was a crowd hallucination. No, some of them reported, well, the sun was looking kind of weird and it looked like a figure. Other people said, well, something was just reflecting off of us and it kind of burned our eyes. Other people said, oh, it was this saint. Oh, it was the Virgin Mary herself. The accounts differ, but the experience is what? A light source, right. not a hallucination of a specific figure interacting with them physically and audibly and even eating in their presence, as the eyewitness accounts report. Or even putting out his hand and saying, put your finger into the nail prints in my hand, and your hand into the wound in my side. Yeah, yeah. to an individual yeah. who, by the way, was not in the position to be persuaded, noting some of the uh, mind control And, and that, that particular individual, Thomas, ended up taking the gospel to any, according to church tradition, ended up being shot through with arrows uh, for his testimony that Jesus rose from the dead. Have After to be being pretty scandalized. convinced. I visited that cave. Yeah, have to be pretty convinced. So the overwhelming change in the life of the disciples. Why? Not because of a feeling, not because of a philosophy, because of the fact that Jesus mm. rose from the dead. Peter himself said, we did not follow cleverly devised fables. We made known to you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. In other words, we saw him. This is what this is all about. And uh, to go from a person that sold Jesus out to literally laying down his life. Uh, according to church tradition, Peter was crucified upside down for his testimony. Uh, you know, you have to explain that. Uh, you know, people will die for sincerely held beliefs, but they're usually taking somebody's word for it. These men were willing to die for first-hand information, first-hand experiences with a living Christ, and it changed their entire lives. The S in our acrostic stands for Scripture. In other words, the resurrection of Jesus was something that should have been anticipated. 
First of all, Jesus himself predicted that he would die, the kind of death that he would die, and three days later he would rise. He pointed to passages like Jonah and his account in The Large Fish as a foreshadowing of what he was going to do. Uh, we take a look at Isaiah chapter 53, the suffering servant, and we are told in that passage that uh, after the suffering, after he see his suffering, he shall prolong his offspring, he shall see his days, and uh, the good pleasure of the Lord shall uh, prosper in his hand. So 700 years before the time of Christ, Jesus' resurrection was predicted, and there are a number of other uh, prophecies in the Old Testament we could cite to back that up. Uh, you know, again, the Apostle Paul said that Jesus died according to the Scriptures and was raised the third day according to the Scriptures. In other words, Jesus fulfilled prophecy, and we could point people to these mm -hmm. prophecies and say, you know, the Isaiah scroll, uh, 200 <coughs> years before the time of Christ, we have a copy of that, has Isaiah 53 in it, and you got a deal. So, and then finally, the E in our acrostic stands for our own experience. That is how knowing Jesus in a personal way has changed our lives individually. Uh, mm -hmm. How Jesus has, uh, again, revealed himself to us. And all of us have a story to tell about uh, who we were before we became uh, Christians. So what, what was it that, that led us to Christ? You know, what, was it, what did it mean for us to make that decision? And mm -hmm. uh, knowing that living Christ is a very powerful thing to share with non-believers. This is where you would insert like your personal testimony. Then. Exactly, hmm. exactly. So history, eyewitness testimony, the riddle of the empty tomb, the overwhelming change in the life of the disciples, scripture fulfilled, and our own experience. Yeah, share those with people and you know, try to keep it more succinct than, than we did. We're kind of filling in all the uh, details for you, or <clears throat> many of them. But uh, really an important thing to have under your belt and really give you confidence to be able to share your faith no matter how skeptical the arena is. And I love that you added the S. I mean, obviously you have to if you're gonna use heroes, but uh, yeah. adding that scripture element in addition to the eyewitness testimony because the gospels are the eyewitness testimony which is in scripture, but the idea that this is a fulfillment of scripture, the Hebrews scripture, the scripture of Jesus' right. day. So that's, that's the awesome. O-T-O-Gs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, thank you, Scott. And uh, did you have you do you have that published anywhere that people could access it? Um, it was in a book uh, that I wrote uh, for the Calvary Basics series called Answers for Skeptics. Um, that is out of print at the moment, but we are seeking to get the goodies together and reprint it. And we'll awesome. be happy to post this as our question of the week, provide resources for any of you listening who would want this in writing. And of course, uh, we're not stingy with material. Feel free to use this. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome.